This is my interview with Larry Calkins, and he is a multi-purpose artist. Sculpture, painting, drawing, photography, and a teacher as well. Have I left anything out, Larry? I think that's about it. Everything. So far. So, you grew up in Corvallis, Oregon. Actually, mm -hmm. west of Corvallis, uh, between Newport and Corvallis and the Coast Range, on the other side of Mary's Peak, which is the big mountain that looks over Corvallis. And um, it's a little valley that uh, my family settled um, over a hundred years ago. Do you think that's affected your work? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's full of stories, I mean, for one thing. My grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather, who um, was the, the grandfather that we were around growing up, um, he told stories and, and uh, amazing stories, and, and um, so definitely influenced by those. And uh, a terrific guy, a farmer. Had a huge uh, cattle ranch, and um, so I learned about farming and all kinds of stuff from, from him. Did you work in the logging industry? I did. I set chokers. Um, Which is at, kind of dangerous, isn't it? It was very that? dangerous. I got injured twice. I got uh, injured in the, hit in the face by a huge cable once. And, um, and also run over by a caterpillar that almost smashed my foot off. Yuck. That was pretty scary. How many years did you work in the logging industry? Uh, not that many years, I guess, into my 20s, from 18 to maybe 25, maybe. When did you realize you wanted to be an artist? Right from the start. I, photography was kind of the first thing that, that piqued my interest. And my parents had a, an old brownie camera. I used to just kind of admire that. My sister and I got up early one morning um, before my parents and and I took a picture of our cat uh, trying to get a goldfish out of the goldfish bowl. So that was like my very first uh, picture. And we weren't really supposed to, to touch the camera, but I did anyway. How do you get your ideas for work? I sketch, I draw a lot, and, uh, and I dream a lot. I have a kind of a photographic memory where I can actually visualize or it comes to me as a complete piece and I can actually just render from my mind what I what I see in my mind, almost like a, a photograph or a movie. Do you see the finished product before it's done or is it an, a kind of an evolution? Generally I do and then and then uh, you know and then I add embellishments. So there's a lot of dreaming and when I say dreaming not not sleep dreaming but Sort of mind dreaming, you know. How long do you think you work on a piece? Let's talk about maybe one of the dresses that you did. Sometimes it, it, it can be a day or two days. Sometimes it can be weeks, depending on, um, you know, getting it to where I, you know, to what I see in my mind. There's there's always those steps, you know, the technical steps, you know, and. And each piece seems to have its own time frame. They have a kind of a sentimental quality. They evoke kind of an endearing feeling. I don't know when I'm looking at them. No, I know, it's true. It's, I mean, some people have actually had kind of emotional reactions to them. Like they're, they're kind of almost uh, brought to tears, in, in, which is pretty interesting to me. And uh, yeah, sentimental, I think, is good. I, I prefer that to, to say nostalgia. Because, uh -huh. you know, I, I'm not really a big nostalgia fan, you know, I mean, that's like trying to go back and recreate something that never existed in the first place. You have a good balance of the, the sweet and the sour. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I like that. I think that's important. Obviously, nature inspires you. What else inspires you to work? Family, friends, um, you know observations, moments, um, definitely animals, my pets, you know, chickens, mules, donkeys, dogs, um, cats, the few things that kind of make sense in the world. Yeah, let's talk about the jewelry. Yeah. So you're selling the jewelry on Etsy now and you just started like how long ago? A couple months, I guess. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to sell my work jewelry work in the, in the galleries because I think of it as, as uh, being an extension of what I do normally. I always think of what I do 
my work as, as one big piece with variations. I never really think of jewelry as being any different than, say, the dresses or the paintings or, or the metal sculpture. It's very unusual and it's very bold and modern and edgy at the same time. I think it's really exciting Thanks. work. I'm Thanks. excited by it. I feel like I'm exactly where I need to be in my work place, you know. I don't think it's, you know, it's not a, it's not just a, a whim, you know. It, I feel like No, I think you really are good at it. So it's, it's still, it's still a vehicle that might evoke something more than just adornment, for an example. Mm -hmm. And I like the way it looks when people wear it. That's a whole nother kind of uh, dimension that adds to it. So when you see it like moving around and and it's like having an installation that, that moves in different mm -hmm. places. And I find mm -hmm. that really fascinating. Do you use mostly found objects? You know, I, I try to. Um, I try to use materials that have some history or some energy that uh, I like to think of it as a kind of psychic energy. That's why I, I, for the, the dresses I use bed sheets because of the intimacy of, of a bed sheet mm. to me is really... Um, Kind of fascinating you know because people you know they sleep on them they make love on them they die on them you know it's like you don't know i get them at thrift stores so i don't know you know History. but something has happened on those uh -huh. bed and you know so they have that kind of energy it, it affects the viewer in some way you were showing me a couple of the jewelry pieces and the scissors i, I found them with a, a metal detector when i go down to see my parents uh, my sister has my sister mickey has a really wonderful metal detector mm -hmm. and I, I use it way more than she does if I love it and so I go out and, uh, and then I make jewelry pieces out of those pieces because for the same reason they have some history a connection and, yeah and that connection to me and to my family and into the valley so it'd be interesting to see who buys that particular piece I, I would I would love to, to to see that too I mean I'm, I'm hoping that somebody will but, but I think they're I think they're kind of cool and I and I combined it with the whole idea of, you know, a little, there's a little piece of paper with a story about scissors on it, and um, there's a rock, and so I kind of like was just sort of playing with the idea of rock, paper, scissors, uh -huh. you know, and, and uh, in kind of a historical context. Tell me a little bit about encaustic. It's, it's a really ancient uh, painting recipe. It's, it's beeswax, ground up mineral pigments, um, and um, Damar resin. Damar, as you know, is a, is a, is a vehicle for varnish in uh, oil paintings. And uh, the wax, being beeswax, um, you know, that's readily available. And then I use, um, then you use um, Damar resin, which is a pitch from a conifer tree, comes from the Middle East, I believe, uh, to harden the wax. So you mix those three together and it's, uh, Invented by the Greeks, uh, the most famous example are the uh, Fayum portraits. And there was a, a Greek community living in Egypt that painted uh, mummy portraits. When somebody died, they would. There was an artisan in the community that would paint this likeness of the person who died, usually stylized a little bit, and, um, and they would nail that onto the sarcophagus and bury them in it. And they've dug these out of the ground like 3,000 plus years ago from, you know, they've been in the ground that long and they're as, they're as bright as when they were painted. In some cases, painted oftentimes on really thin cedar. Oftentimes the cedar is rotted away and just the, uh, the layer of wax is left behind. But it's, wax is completely unaffected by the elements. It's a very old and, and uh, and then in modern times, Jasper Johns is, is, comes to mind. He's probably one of the most famous modern artists that use encaustic. Isn't that the through line for all your work? It all has a kind of a weathered feel to it. Yeah. The sculpture and the jewelry. And Time. What about the photography? Even photography, I'm, I'm really fascinated by using uh, vintage cameras oftentimes. Um, negatives made out of in photo paper which is an old technique that was used in the 1800s uh, called calotypes, I believe. But even my printing techniques, and you know, when I was doing black and white photography, 
you know, I, I tended towards a more vintage look, a 19th century look, which is, to me, is the, is still, to this day, I think, the, uh, the heyday of photography. It's, it's when all this experimentation was being done. Uh, cyanotype, um, the calotype that I mentioned, um, daguerreotype, tintypes, um, ambrotype. It was just like a whole list of all these things that people were were experimenting with in Victorian times. It was, it was a beautiful... And black and white photography really has a lot of depth yeah. to it, doesn't it? It does because, you know, it kind of takes color out of the equation, which can be kind of extraneous and... and so then there's the shadow and light. It's all about shadow and light and, and emotion. There's something quite beautiful about black and white. The classes that you teach, tell me about that. And how long ago did you start doing this? I think my first class was 2001 or shortly afterwards. Uh -huh. um, so I, I was invited to teach down at the Glass Museum in Tacoma doing residency. And uh, so that was my first kind of teaching gigs. And then, then I started teaching at a place called Pratt Fine Arts mm -hmm. in Seattle. And uh, my very first class was a, a dress form class. So the whole idea was based on dresses and the, the, the forms the, that you see, you know, the you know, dress, dress forms, I guess. It was a combination of welding and, and, and sewing and, and uh, creating a, a dress form. And that, and using wax, and that sort of parlayed into um, encaustic painting. And that's what I really became known for. Mm -hmm. And then um, I've been doing that for ever since. And uh, and uh, and in those days, hardly anybody was doing it. I mean, now a lot of people teach it. A lot of uh, my students are teaching it now. The person who was my assistant at the time opened a little uh, encaustic studio and, and classroom over in West Seattle called Northwest Encaustic. And um, I teach I teach for him sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I teach a kind of I call it rustic adornment, and mm -hmm. I teach it out here in my studio. And, and uh, that's something somewhat new. I've been teaching more and more out here. Uh, small classes, more intimate, and it's my favorite thing to do. People who are brave enough to come out and take a class enjoy it because they're kind of in the environment of a working artist. It's a whole day, mm -hmm. oftentimes two days, mm -hmm. and uh, people really enjoy it, and, and I like it because I'm at home. But I teach a, a, a doll making class. You've seen some of my doll pieces in the studio. If you could live anywhere else in the world, where would it be? England. England. Why? My family's from there, from Scotland and England, both sides. And I felt a real sense of homecoming when I went there the first time that I can't even explain. It was like almost genetic. And, and I, I lived there for a year once. Uh, my first wife and I, I went there and, and uh, we lived there and that's where she still lives to this day. But I lived in, the, in London and I lived in the south um, in uh, Dorset. Mm -hmm. And that's where nice. my first wife beautiful. was from. Really beautiful. Beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. It was a pretty great experience for me because I was really young at the time. Uh -huh. And, uh, and we were, it was in the 70s during the kind of the punk revolution. Yeah, that was fun. So what have you got up and coming now? Next year I'll be showing in Provincetown at, at Rice Pollock Gallery where I show. Mm -hmm. And I've been showing with them for several years. And like, Do you go to the show? I've gone to a sh an opening in New York at, mm -hmm. at my uh, American Primitive where I've been showing. Mm -hmm. um, I go to the ones in Seattle at, at G. Gibson Gallery. Mm -hmm. If you were in the forest and you had to build a structure for shelter, you had 10 days of sunshine and the rest of the winter it would rain and snow, what would this structure or home look like? It would be, uh, I'd find a, a tree that's fallen over, which creates a big hole because the, the root wad pulls out. And then I uh, would build a, a dig, dig that out, and then I would build a, a a roof over that that would have a bit of a slope, kind of like a roundhouse, mm -hmm. and um, and then I would carve little shelves in there, and um, and that's where I would live. Thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome.